Hmm? Not recording. Not recording this progress. Before we start, uh, the real understanding is with every medical condition. The basic premise is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of every single thing. And, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned 
ان قرآن مجید الرجیم اللہ سبحان و تعالی از دا کیز اب دا انسین لا یا علمہا الا ہو و یا علمہا فی البری والبحری و ما تسکتو میں ورکت الا یا علمہا ان اللہ سبحان و تعالی دروزی تو دا فائنس پوائنٹ دیت نوٹ ایون ای لیف فالز ولا حبت فی ظلمات الارض ولا رتوین ولا یابسین الا فی کتاب مبین ان دا ایزنٹ لیترلی نافنگ ہیپنز ان دا ہیونز ان دا ارد اندر دا سی ان دا darkness of night that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not aware of. Allah ta'ala is aware of every condition of ours. So whatever has happened to us has befallen us with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it abundantly clear in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir that Allah ta'ala has authority and control over everything that happens in the, in the world. So The sickness, the cure, all of that is in the hands of Allah and we need to keep that. That is the basis of our iman, that is tawakkul. But tawakkul doesn't say that we must not seek help. So even when uh, Hazrat Ibrahim a.s. was describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Numbarud, he said, وَإِذَا مَرِتُّ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ And when I become sick, then who? He is the one who cures me. In other words, it is Allah. So in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has control over everything. And Allah is the one who brought the illness and Allah ta'ala is brought, is, will also bring the cure. But it is, we are duty-bound to seek help and that is from the sunnah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who had the most tawakkul, the most trust in Allah, who was the most muttaqi person, who basically, you cannot get closer to Allah than how Nabi alayhi salam did. Yet he sought treatment to make it easy for us that when you are sick, go and get treatment. And Allah Ta'ala has put cure in certain things. There is not an illness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent down except that Allah Ta'ala sent a cure. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll deal with them towards the end. So just to understand how common Or what is bipolar, uh, bipolar disease? Bipolar disorder, it was previously known as manic depression. And it's characterized by periods of depression and periods of abnormally elevated mood. Now, when I say depression and elevated mood, we all have that. A good thing happened, something uh, wonderful happened in your life. Uh, the day you're getting married, you are elated, you are excited, you are happy. That's normal. There's some days you get depressed. You might have met up, uh, Allah save us, in a car accident. You feel down, the car is messed. The, you now know you're going to struggle for the next two weeks or three weeks without the car, all those things. So a person does, those are normal. In depression that we talk, that it becomes, when it becomes an illness, it means it becomes debilitating. The person is now no longer able to function normally. That person struggles. And on the other side of the coin, even with the elated mood, they become non-functional and we'll discuss that a little bit. So to give you some idea of the statistics of what we're dealing with, and really it is an illness that we have not appreciated and they say 40 million people in the world are affected by bipolar. I would like to believe it is a lot more because a lot of people would not come forward with a diagnosis. And so often we tend to will it away as other things and we say, no, it may be a gene. It may be possible. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But as far as medical statistics go, there are 40 million. In America alone, they're sitting with 10 million known cases of bipolar. 82% of those are severely affected, means they, are, they struggle to continue their lives. About 3% of adolescents suffer from bipolar. So it is an illness that starts in adolescence and it goes through um, generally till about 40, 45 at the onset. And thereafter, you find the other illnesses creeping in, but it can literally start at any age. We don't see it in children, 
Generally, women are more likely to suffer from bipolar 2, and I'll discuss that a little bit. And it is the one that causes the highest impairment. So depression causes a little bit of disability, OCD, all the other ones that we know, ADHD, all of them do cause harm and difficulty. But this illness is particularly devastating because it is two things. One is it's cyclical. So you're not in a steady state. A depressed person we know is always depressed or she's always depressed. So we know we treat the depression. This, the depression, then suddenly they they go into an elated mood. Not two weeks later, they've gone down again. So it's very difficult from a treatment point of view. And also for that person, like, hey, I was feeling great this week. Suddenly, what happened? Like, what happened? I'm now down. So it is a very difficult uh, illness to treat. And the other thing is it really puts, the depression is very severe and really puts a person through difficulty. So, um, as I mentioned, you have the happiness, you have the highs. Can you please mute your mic? Please, it's disturbing the presentation. Dr. Sir, just unmute yourself, please. I muted everyone else, and in the process, you also got muted. Is it audible now? Cheetahs are clear. Okay, let's just get my presentation back. Okay, so as I was saying, sometimes we believe that, you know what, Muslims should not get depressed, Muslims should not suffer from mental illnesses, but it does happen. And the proof for that, that it is acceptable is, is few. One is usually when in fiqh, when we say that a person who should pray salah, then we should we say it should be, a, it should be akil, it should be baalikh. So in other words, you have to have sanity. Akil means to have sanity. Bali means that you must be on that person, that you must be mature in terms of you must stay past the age of puberty. So in that already is saying that a person, there is a possibility of people not being happy. In other words, they are yeah, not in the mental capacity to think. And in the very famous dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he sought refuge from many things and he said, Allah, I will become an alhamdi wal husn. Oh Allah, I seek refuge from you from worry and grief. And that is also, and in another, uh, there are several other duas where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought refuge from Junun, which is madness. So in all of this, I just need to iron out some myths. And one of the myths is that that person who goes swinging in the morning is in a great mood. By afternoon, he's got a violent temper. By night time, he's depressed. That is not bipolar. Okay. Uh, we popularly, we often hear somebody say, hey, my husband is bipolar. Because he, in these moods, swing in the morning is one person in the night. That is not bipolar. Bipolar, the cycles, the least, least cycle, the shortest is one week. So it's not going to happen within one day that suddenly the person now goes from being elated to being totally depressed. Just on a side note, unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of substance abuse. That is a hallmark of substance abuse, where the person in the, in the morning is down, is out, can barely get out of bed, leave me alone, I don't want to talk to you. By nighttime, oh, he's like all over the place, uh, laughing, anything is um, excites him, anything. Just that is substance abuse. Please look into that. So what does bipolar look like? And basically, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail about the medical, the actual medical condition itself. To give you an idea, there are four types of bipolar. Bipolar 1, 2, cyclothymic, and unspecified. 
What's the difference? As I mentioned, bipolar is basically alternating between sadness and happiness. Okay, sadness and happiness. And if you look at it on this graph, you'll see that bipolar one, they go up to very high levels. Their mania reaches like ridiculous levels. And in that state, they do things that normal people don't do. So the man will take, and I know one patient literally took whatever money he had, put it in a box, and he was standing outside the mosque dishing it out. I know you're going to ask which mosque. Um, and they do, if they're making decisions, they'll go out and they'll go and buy a, the most expensive car on credit, sign all the documents, and now the family is sitting with a problem. And they reach like where they literally don't sleep. They on, they on like Duracell batteries twenty four seven. They are on high. They busy. They want to get involved in this. They get involved in that. Suddenly, you see the men sending tweets at like about ten. I mean, or, or on WhatsApp, five ten a, a minute coming through. That is mania. Where it is seriously a problem, and that's a green line. And then suddenly. Almost suddenly, when I say suddenly, within a week, they drop down into the most severe of depressions. And it really, really becomes very difficult for people around them and even for themselves. Because in that euphoric state, they can do anything. They believe they Superman. They got no inhibitions. That person will say, you tell him you think you... So there's like no filters. Bipolar 2, which is more common, where they don't reach the manic phase, they reach what we call hypomania. So they don't go like totally erratic. They still see they start, they start talking faster. They have no filters. If they want to call you stupid, they'll call you stupid. They like the, the, the filters are gone. So that person is no longer inhibited, inhibited. If he wants to drive at 160, he believes he must drive at 160, he will. Without worrying about the consequences, without caring about what's happening. So they are a danger to themselves. And the hypomania is not as bad as the mania. And their, their drops can also be severe. Okay? And the problem is not everybody cycles the same. Some people, some you get, they, they rapid cycle. So every two weeks almost is changing. But by and large, a person usually goes once, maybe twice. Once a year, it goes into a high phase. Then once a year, goes down into a low phase. And with the patients, usually we know, like, okay, coming towards winter, check on the patient, ask them how they're doing. Because they don't perceive it. They don't perceive that they're starting to slip. Or they don't perceive that they're going high. And sometimes... Somebody will have to tell them that, why are you talking so loud? Then they realize, okay, we're going up into the high phase. Then the cyclothymia, which is similar where they go into hypomanic, not so bad depressions, but it is more regular. It is more like smooth, the changes. So they know what they're doing. Then you get the last one, which is a mixed one. To complicate things, uh, together with bipolar 1, 2, and 3, and all the others, you get bipolar with a seasonal pattern. You get bipolar with mixed fire. We get bi rapid cycling bipolar, and that is why it is necessary to consult a professional. Uh, the average doctor will not be able to cope depression. Maybe we can manage it. But bipolar is a very, very difficult situation because think about it. You, you treat the patient with antidepressants. He comes out of his depression and now he's going up. Those antidepressants are pushing him further up. So now you have to pull that back. So one of the things we use is mood stabilizers, which basically tries to level this whole thing out. So the second myth I need to dispel is that bipolar will go away. You don't outgrow it. It doesn't disappear. It may become milder, but usually it becomes more severe. It usually becomes more problematic. By that time, the family is already battling. Please consider if you're married to a partner who cycles like this, 
and he or she is like in a high, the normal, they're almost the hyper normal. Come and bake the cake, come and do this, come and do that, come and do that. The next week, they've hit rock bottom. How do you think that marriage survives? Or you've got an employee, and that employee is working happily, and next week, or is hyper working. I mean, he's doing like the output of 10 men. And the next week, he hits a low. And what you tell him, you're putting on. you just trying to cause, you're just trying to put me on. So it is a very, very difficult situation and it's not going to go away. So just a quick revision of what we said. Type 1 is individuals who experience manic. That means they reach the full height and depressive episodes. And please, this point is very important. At least a period of one week per episode. The person who changes his moods in the day is something else, usually substance abuse. Type 2, they don't go to hypomania, they go to hypomania and depressive episodes. Cyclothymia, they have continuous fluctua fluctuations. Okay, And then there are those who don't meet that criteria of either of the three. And then we just put them in the unspecified character, uh, category. In bipolar 1, the depression tends to be milder than other bipolars. But the mania is like severe. It can last a week. It can last up to six months. Six months. Okay. In bipolar 2, the mania is milder, but the depression is more severe. Okay. And we'll come to some of the symptoms. So just to emphasize again, it's not an easy diagnosis. The person or the consultant has to sit and really go through it because there's a lot of things that look like that. There's a lot of things where it may look like the guy is manic. It might be depression with anxiety. It, uh, it may be a lot of other things. And we don't want to just miss the diagnosis because the treatment is very different. What kind of symptoms do they experience? As I say, you've got to marry, marry between the manic episode and the depressive episode. During the manic episode, they act very impulsively. As I say, like no filters, no breaks. They just do it. If he thinks, you know what, I should go and tell that woman that she's horribly ugly, the man will walk up to her, even though her husband is six foot four, and tell her, you look very ugly. And the consequences, they don't, they don't, appreciate the consequences and the person on the receiving end also doesn't understand like if this man is sick because the guy who comes there with a the crutch and that okay you know he's sick so if he's wobbling and he bumped you forgive him because yeah he's sick. but this you don't know if they're sick they talk faster than usual sometimes really fast and louder they have racing thoughts so they, they their thoughts move and they find it difficult to concentrate when they have to do a task. So imagine a student at university in a manic phase. He can't concentrate. He's working, he's pushing, but he can't remember things. They're jumpy, they're excited, they they feel like they're the greatest in the world. There's nothing, nothing that's get better than them. Uh, they sleep much less than usual. Some of them don't sleep whole night. Uh, they have very short fuses. As I say, there's no more filters. Others normally a person you... You know what, the food is a little bit late, you make sour. No. In a manic or hypermanic episode, there's no filters, there's no breaks. They just shoot. Then you go to the other side, which is the depressive episode. And there they start feeling very sad, very low, hopeless, just like a full-blown depression. They start isolating from others. They stay on their own. They cannot concentrate. They start getting suicidal thoughts. And Sadly, about 10% of bipolar disorders commit suicide. They start talking very slowly, like a depressed person. They're not interested in eating, talking. They may eat too little. They may eat too much. They'll sleep the whole day. They have like no energy, just like when a person is really down. That's what happens to them. This is just, and all these symptoms are not necessarily present in all patients. Some patients present with some, some patients present with others. So in essence, you, the essence of bipolar is literally that it is bipolar. It goes from low to high. 
unlike when you have a patient who's depressed, they're depressed all the time. You give them meds, they take their meds, they come out of the depression, and you can kind of hold them there. This is very, very difficult to manage because, as I say, sometimes they don't have a pattern. They can cycle on a trigger and there are certain things that might trigger them and then suddenly drop from that being that hypomanic phase into a depression. And it really, just think for a moment, the challenges that the people around them and they face. And one of the purposes of mentioning these is just to create awareness there are things like this and it's not easy or it's not fair to just say okay you're just acting but you can pull yourself together last week you were like on top of the dr sap you we lost you in the voice you were saying last week something and then the voice cut. Dr. Saf, can you hear me? G. So you were saying something last week and then your voice cut. Just repeat it and then you can carry on. Okay. Jazakallah for uh, notifying me. I said a the, the family member will say last week you were elated, you were all over the place, you were the life of the party, you were laughing, joking, you were making us roll on the floor. Today you're like, you're about ready to die. What's wrong with you? Are you malingering? Are you lying? Are you just putting on a show? People don't appreciate and understand it. So one of the first things that we need to do if we do find or we get somebody who we think, first get the diagnosis. Once we've got the diagnosis, then the whole family unit, the whole, everybody around that person needs to come together. It's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. It's like a diabetic. We make changes in the house, like, okay, so now, sorry guys, no more gajar halwa every day for supper, no more uh, chocolate eclairs. We're going to have to tone it down because daddy's got diabetes. But here, what happens is, people start turning away. We don't become empathetic. And I'm not talking about sympathy. Sympathy is to say, ah, shame. We need to empathize and just appreciate what these people are going through. So by and large, herbal treatments on their own don't work. We use them as adjuncts. You can use cupping. You can use other herbs. But on their own, it's very hard to treat this because it's a chemical imbalance within the brain. And you need all the factors. Khalil Institute in America, which has done a lot of work with Islamic psychotherapy, where they've combined the medical, they've combined normal psychotherapy together with um, religion, together with bringing the person's deen together. And their studies found that 90% of the people coped through prayer and turning to deen. So together with the other things. So they do need that. And this should be a means of drawing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they approach using an integrated method where they use the medication, they use psychotherapy, they use CBT, they use all the other things. Um, and I said CBT, not CBT, don't mix it up with uh, oil from cannabis. Um, and we are fortunate that we have our deen to support us. We have a, a belief structure that this came from Allah. My Allah is going to... I can't no belief structure. All you got to do is to tell them, like, you got to pull it through on your own. There's no Allah coming to help you. There's no one else. So what we use is... A, to use prescription medication, and I'm not going to go into all of those. The mainstay of, of prescription medication is to use a mood stabilizer, where basically we try and instead of having that fluctuating mood, we try and control it so that the mood, it still goes up and down, but not so violently. Then we use lifestyle changes, so to get the person exercise is very useful. As I said, Salah, getting the person to go into, you know, concert in the groups, 
go sit in the company of good people, alternative treatments, uh, whatever works. And these are, you cannot, as I say, you're not going to cure it with alternative treatments, but some of them do help. And that needs to be discussed with whoever is treating the patient. And it's not usually one person who's going to treat the patient. So you're basically going to get the behavioral therapist involved. You're going to get all the other people uh, involved, the psychologist, the psychotherapist, and bring it all on board. Just one thing I didn't mention was the causes because there's no clarity on anything that causes it. So there's no, like, you can put your finger on it and say, this bacteria caused it, like we do with a pneumonia or something. Yeah, it's like so many different factors, whether it's genetic, but there is a very strong genetic component. If the parents were bipolar, the children will be bipolar. And as I mentioned, and this is where we really need to focus on is how we support these people. And the first thing is we need to make a diagnosis. So when you see somebody behaving erratically, please have them taken to somebody who can assess them properly. Because as I showed you in that slide with all the different kinds of conditions that can present like this, it's very really difficult to make a diagnosis. And if you make the wrong diagnosis, you give the wrong treatment and then you get the wrong results. Now, this one needs treatment and it needs monitoring. And once you found out that, okay, one of the family members or whoever it is has bipolar, yes, it's got a stigma and our society is not very sympathetic to these people. And that's really, really sad because uh, just as we are understanding of diabetics, we're understanding of people with Parkinson's, we try and help those with a broken leg. But when it comes to bipolar or any other mental illness, we actually shy away from these people. It's not contagious. Inside, they are pretty normal, except for having this chemical imbalance that is causing violent uh, mood shifts. And they're struggling. And if everybody just like walks out of their lives, it makes it so difficult for them. You're in a depression. You're down and out. And like everybody's telling you, you know, just get up, pull yourself together and let's go. And you're like, if... And you, the person is probably saying, if only you people can see the darkness that surrounds me. So educate yourself on the disorder and what type they have. Make note of the symptoms and treat if they are. So you hear, and some people are very smart. You, their spouses will tell you, you know what, he's talking about louder. Um, or she's starting to tweet, uh, send out a lot more messages. We're going into our up phase. Thank you for monitoring. We start, we change, we put in interventions and uh, we get them under control and whatever else it is, we minimize the effect of the illness. Be an active listener and establish healthy boundaries. So what that means is if you, if you are in a relationship with somebody who's been diagnosed with this, it's difficult. You need to support them. You need to assist them it's like a sick person. And this is the rahma that a lot Allah puts between partners, that when any one of them is diagnosed with an illness, then you see how the other one steps up and really they fulfill the role of caregiver than to none. And this is not, sometimes the husband takes care of the wife, sometimes the wife takes care of the husband. And this is a moment when we need to come together. And that's why we say, I say we are so blessed to have our dean, which teaches us these things. Encourage them to keep up with the treatment and medication. And that's the other thing. Sometimes in their manic phase, especially, they forget. Or they say, I don't need this. I told you, he's got uh, delusions of grandeur. I don't need medication. I am the medication. And uh, then they stop taking their meds. And it just compounds the problem. So they need to be supervised or sometimes they're in a depression. And in a depression, like I don't feel like taking meds. And also together with caring for the, for the patient, you need to just make sure if it's a husband or wife, you need to make sure that you look after your own mental health. Very taxing. 
So in terms of treatment, treating of the scale, you're treating the mania, you're treating the depression. Sometimes you need antidepressants, sometimes you need something to bring the person down. So we use, and just this is just in a nutshell, as I say, I'm not going to go into this. This is a field that a psychiatrist would deal with. Mood stabilizers, just basically get it under control and so that the fluctuations are not so violent. Okay, The one we commonly use is lithium. Um, and all, all these medications do have side effects. All these medications do have problems, but we weigh it up and say, okay, so you will have this problem, but at least you'll be able to live a near normal life. And as far as becoming addicted to these medications, this is not a drug that's giving you enjoyment. It is a medication that is necessary, and if you have to take it for your life, you take it. Just as a diabetic takes that glucophage every day, for, every, for as long as it, and nobody says you're addicted to glucophage. You're not addicted to it because you don't find pleasure in it. And secondly, you are you need the medication to just keep your your yourself sane. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with taking medication. In the Sunnah Nabi Alayhi Salam took medication. So there's nothing wrong with taking medication. So long as it conforms, don't want to go into do things that are haram. But even that, if there's burora, if there's absolute necessity, even that would be permissible. So we use mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, antiepileptics, antidepressants. Then, as I say, together with that, you use psychotherapy, lifestyle modification, all the other things that we use together with that. So it's it's a multimodal therapy. It's not just one. The common stuff that we use. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the condition will know lithium is the one that we really use. Um, and you've got to text, test the levels very often because uh, it is a toxic drug. And if you go too far out with your, if you're not watching the doses, or sometimes the person is not being careful with their dose and they forgot and they start doubling the dose, you can cause problems. So that needs to be checked regularly. Atypical psych, uh, antipsychotics, we used a little bit better and easy to 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 easier to manage. Um, and then we use valproic acid, which we used to use for epileptics, but it works well here as a smooth stabilizer. And each one of them is listen to the drawbacks, but they so rare, so rare. We don't mean that it don't doesn't happen. Oh, it can never happen. But treatment helps. It at least gets a person functional. And the patients that I have, and you manage them, and they now know, okay, we're going up in treatment, or we're going, I mean, we're going up in, uh, I need to do this. Or the wife will phone me, and they, I can see he's going up again. Then we give the treatment, bring him into normality, they're still an up. And I just want to share with you, um, I asked one of my patients, I got to do this presentation. I can't tell them from inside of me how I feel. Can you share with me some of what goes on inside of you with this illness? And he's had it for a good few years, uh, 15, no, maybe 20 years plus. <clears throat> and he takes his medication. And as I say, he's, he's, he's very functional. He does, he does a lot. He's a teacher. He continues manages to teach because he's aware of he's part of the family. Because he's taking medication and he's got a very strong belief structure. All these elements come together so that he, at least the person is functional. He's not sitting at home. He's not being, he's, he's out in society. And really, it makes a difference to a person when you can go out and be normal. So some of the things he shared with me, and he said it's important that if the husband or wife are bipolar, then before getting married, there should be disclosure of this. And I have come across cases where, unfortunately, people marry off their children knowing full well that they've got major depressive disorder or ADHD or bipolar in the hope that they will get better. 
And I can't tell you when you see the difficulties that people have gone through and the hardships they face. And I don't think that's fair to do to anybody. So if you are aware, then rather disclose it up front. And if they still want to go ahead with it, by all means. And you mentioned also, you said marriages can come under strain due to this condition. Mm-hmm. And he has a very supportive spouse. And, and really, she's the one who gives him a lot of support and his children also are wonderful because they understand the condition and they appreciate that it's not going to go away and their father's not malingering nor is he putting on. And then he made the point, he said, having a spouse who can help one manage this condition is important. So having somebody around you, whether it be a spouse, whether it be a brother, whether it be a parent, um, and this is very important, and I mentioned it earlier, the spouse is able to pick up the indications of change in one's moods even before you can. And his wife will phone me and say, I think he's going down. And this is long before. And I ask him, no, I'm doing okay. I'm fine. And then she'll like, recount this symptom, that symptom, that symptom. And he'll admit and say that, yeah, I, I think we are going down. Let's switch the medication. Let's change it. And he mentioned really very upbeat. And he said, I can, one can live a normal life with bipolar, bipolar disorder and continue to fulfill one's responsibilities, provided you got the necessary help. So it doesn't mean we have to write these people off, but don't give them treatment or don't attend to the disorder. Yeah, you're putting them in a very compromised position. You're putting them in a position where they are non-functional. So what happens, and we have a, a horrible habit of sticking labels on this one, no, he's mental. Uh, this one like that, that one like that. And that's not fair. Really, we don't know what the difficulties these people go through, the challenges they face, they face the hardships they have to go through. It's, it's beyond belief. And yet you look at them outside and you don't see a single mark, not a single scar. No crutches, no anything. You say, is this person now just putting on what? How can your mood go like that? But when you understand, then you start becoming empathetic and you become supportive. And being upbeat is he always, he says, bipolar is all bad. And that would come from a person very positive. He says that sometimes one is able to do be more creative and productive than you would usually be. And that's in the hypomanic phase. Okay, So in a hypomanic phase, uh, he used to get manic phases and those are little, really bad. But you like, you moving at double the speed. You can push out work as you can and suddenly you get brain waves that you don't think because the, the brain is lit up. It's just going. And uh, being a teacher, he enjoys that because he then gets insights which he then uh, conveys to his students. And these opportunities have to be used in such a way that one does not become manic, but is able to channel channel the energy for doing what you would normally not be able to do. And he mentioned here the last point, treatment should always be the main goal, but those specific benefits can always remain if treated correctly. In other words, when we treat, you don't want to take the manic person right down into depression. And you don't want to take the depressive person right out into a manic phase. So you see the difficulty we face. The problem with this, and it is really, really something that's not easy to treat. It needs a lot of people on board and you need to have everybody appreciating and understanding what the person is going through. And lastly, I want to just mention this uh, beautiful hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he met, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he asked that uh, Atab bin Abu Rabba, he said Ibn Abbas asked him whether he would like to see, he would show him a woman who is from the people of Jannah. So he said, of course, I would like to see. And he said, there's this woman. She came to Rasulullah sallallahu
Dr. Saab, we must you with the voice. I don't know if you can hear me. You, you, uh, yes. Can you just start from the hadith again, please? In the, okay. In the hadith um, narrated by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he said, Atta bin Abu Rabah, rahmatullah alayhi, came to him and he said, uh, he asked him, he said, would you like to see somebody from Jannah? And he said, of course I would. And he showed him a woman and he said, this woman, came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she said, I suffer from epilepsy. And during this convulsions and fits, my body is exposed because you're not conscious, you're not aware, and you're moving your limbs and your body can, could become exposed. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you wish and you endure it patiently, you make sabr, you will be rewarded with Jannah. Or if you wish, I'll make the to Allah to cure you. And this is just not that we mustn't be cured, but what the level of sabr is and where it will take you to. Look at her answer. She said, I'll endure it. I'll, I'll tolerate this illness because I know my ultimate goal is Jannah. Then she asked only one thing. She said, but my body is exposed, so make dua to Allah that that doesn't happen. The sickness can continue, but just that of exposing my body uh, these people were amazing because they understood that that which may be an illness and a problem is actually their ticket to Jannah. So, in, 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 in conclusion and understanding what we're dealing with, we need to appreciate that it came from Allah. And if we do, it is our duty to do whatever we possibly can to make it easy for ourselves and to remedy it. Because appreciate that a person who has bipolar is not only affecting himself or herself, they're affecting all those around them. So, as Allah Ta'ala mentioned in this ayat al-Karima, whatever befalls you is only with Ibnillah. It is only with the permission of Allah. And whosoever has uh, belief means he understands and he believes that this is from my Allah. And even though I'm taking medication, I know that the medication is not there, but Allah Ta'ala used it as a means. And whoever is Dr. Saab, we lost you again with the voice. You stopped it, whoever it is. Uh, so, just going back, I don't show where we lost, but whosoever believes in Allah, that whosoever believes in Allah, in other words, not that he just accepts, but he firmly believes that Allah is in control of everything, and I will take the medication. And my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has put capacity in the medic medication. So, um, and Allah knows that what is in my I'm doing it and I will bear patiently whatever difficulty descends on me. And I will accept whatever has befallen me. But we still have to uh, look for treatment and try and make it work so that those people around us and ourselves are not compromised. So just some tips on how to cope. Seek help. Take medication under the guidance of a acceptor of a person who is experienced. Appreciate your condition. Make sabar. And explain it to those around you. We need to move away from the stigma of medical illnesses. It is from Allah just as every other illness. And it is the treatment is from Allah, just as every other treatment. And if we are going to look down on somebody because they have something that Allah Ta'ala sent down upon them, then we need to inspect ourselves and examine where we are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from all these illnesses, protect us from sadness, grief, uh, madness, all the things that Nabi alayhi salam sought protection from. And may Allah Ta'ala grant us uh, eternal abode in Jannah. Inshallah, if there's any questions, we'll take them now. So the one question that came in, Dr. Sarp, is can a person uh, 
uh, the question reads, just give me one second. Can a, a patient with bipolar 2 have a slip after many years? Yes. I'm not sure what they mean exactly by a slip. But yeah, because it's a chemical imbalance, it doesn't mean that it's static. Sometimes the chemicals may get even more imbalanced. Sometimes they may improve. So it is not static in that it will never change. Uh, some of them get better, some of them get worse. So it can, uh, if that's what I understand by slip, yes, they can slip. Also, if they slip, generally you need to go back and review their medication. Sometimes patients are on lithium for years, and then we find that the lithium has stopped working. Um, so that also happens. So again, you need to go back and revisit it. And that we do on a case-for-case -case basis. There was a lady that had a hand up. I think her name is Rukaya. Appa, would you like to say something or ask a question? <clears throat> the easiest way for people that wanted to get through Dr. Sap was, uh, I'm just going to give you a generic email. You can contact me through there. I'll pass your communication over. Dr. Sap is a bit busy. I'll just help facilitate it. It's Chwane at jamietsa.org. Chwane at jamietsa.org. If you send me any communication, I will forward it to Dr. Sap, and then we could create correspondence from there, inshallah. We'll give a minute or two for any questions or anything else, and then from there... The question is, I got severe bipolar disorder. And I take my medication on time and I get mania anytime. That is the, I'm not sure that is the comment, but maybe there's a question in it, Dr. Sir. Um, yeah, it just, again, the medication then needs to be reviewed because, uh, as I say, with some patients, it does happen with the mania. Uh, on that, I would say review the, the, they must review the medication and they must look for triggers. Because sometimes, sometimes you just find a certain trigger that tips the person into mania or tips the person into depression. But that also is testament to tell you just how volatile the situation is. That literally they can drop from being normal to go manic overnight almost. We say Jazakallah to Dr. Sap and everyone that has attended. We look forward to, uh, from you all, what would you like Dr. Sap to be able to uh, have on? And thereafter, we'll facilitate the workshop from our side. Jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Jazakumullah.